it be a light to you in dark places when all other lights go out. As Mr. J.R.R. Tolkien said in The Fellowship of the Ring, and today, my friends, we are seeking out the light. (laughs) Welcome to another episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. This week, we're investigating embedded optical modules with Jerry Prasad from Reflex Photonics, the light on board company. We also check out a new use for optical fibers embedded under our streets and why passive infrared sensors are perfect for IoT edge devices. So first off, let's bring in those embedded optical modules. My guest today is Jerry Prasad from Reflex Photonics. Thank you so much for joining me, Jerry. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Amelia, for inviting me. Okay, so first off, for my audience who may not know, what is Reflex Photonics all about? So Reflex Photonics is a manufacturer of rugged embedded optical modules, and we are based in Montreal, Canada. Okay, so you guys are known as the Light on Board Company, and I'm especially interested in your Light Able Embedded Optical Module. So tell me more about this module, and what is it by me as an engineer? So the lightable embedded optical module is basically a chip-sized device that has uh, 12 to 24 fibers inside this device. This can deliver a tremendous amount of bandwidth in a very small space. So, for example, in the defense sector, where swap is very important, that space, weight, and power, they find that to be something of great value uh, to them. What is unique about Lightable is it's not only able to deliver that much bandwidth in a small space, but it's a very rugged device. So, for example, you can um, surface mount this part onto a board, so you can subject it to relatively high heats, which is like 230 degrees for solder flow temperature, and it will survive it. Wow. That is very unique in the industry. We're probably the only guys who can do that, yeah. right? Now, what does uh, surface mounting give you for uh, military industry? It would give you things like high shock and vibration tolerance. Um, we can survive um, a lot of thermal cycling. We can survive uh, extreme temperature environments. So, for example, we are expected to have storage temperatures of minus 57 to 125. Wow. It is quite common for us to be expected to operate from minus 45 degrees all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius and still deliver all this bandwidth. There's a number of benefits you do get from using embedded optics that you would not otherwise get from, say, using commercial type modules or other competitor type uh, embedded optics. Okay, so you guys just released two new transceivers called Light Space and Light Vision. So what kind of markets are you guys targeting with these transceivers and what are the benefits in using them in my next design? So the Light Space uh, product is really an offshoot of our Lightable product, which was targeted more to the defense sector. Uh, Light Space is what you might call more of an ultra-rugged part. And the main reason uh, we call ultra-rugged is because it will be deployed in space application, in particular low-Earth orbit satellite communication uh, environment, where they're trying to shrink the size down of the satellite and implement things like uh, electronic beam steering, right? Okay. So, and, uh, so the benefits, as I say, is you get a rad hard part that can work in this extremely harsh environment. That's the uh, light space product. Uh, incidentally, uh, we went through an extensive evaluation process um, with a number of different competitors, and we were the only ones that passed all the tests and was able to be selected uh, by a major defense contractor. Uh, with regards to the light vision that you asked for, light vision also benefits from our technology, but it's now addressed in a lower market, what we call more the industrial type uh, market, where they still need the minus 40 to plus 85 operation, but they need a lower cost and maybe not the level of ruggedization that the defense sector would use. So targeting things like... Um, you know, in-flight entertainment, machine vision, smart cities, any kind of factory automation. That, that would be the application for the light vision. Okay, Jerry, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, I have never been to Montreal, but I do have a 
trip planned in the near future? What is one thing I cannot miss when I go travel there? Well, the what you can't miss is old Montreal. It's a beautiful part of Montreal, and especially in the summertime, lots of restaurants, nightclubs. Um, the, you can go by the uh, by the wharf, for, for example. It's uh, nightlife is excellent. Uh, great food. Uh, great people. It's very multicultural. It's just an awesome place to visit. So old Montreal. Perfect. I will make it on my list. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Jerry. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much, Amelia. I, I appreciate it. Speaking of optics, fiber optics in this case, this week's news you may have missed is brought to you by a super seismic study by Stanford University. Now, I don't know where you're from, but every couple of years, it seems, there's all this talk of the big one coming to the Pacific Northwest. Recently, geologists have put the chance of a big earthquake hitting the Cascadia subduction zone. That's the fault line that runs off the coast of California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia at 7 to 15 percent over the next 50 years. A map of the hot zones for potential earthquakes in the United States, published last fall, pretty much has the entire West Coast in the highest hazard area. (laughs) Now, there has been a lot of talk as well about early detection systems, like the one used in Mexico in September of last year. But at best, those types of warning systems can only give us about a minute or two of warning before the seismic waves hit. Well, is there a better way? A team at Stanford University thinks so. We could have a complex earthquake detection system already in place, below our feet, in the optical fiber cables that deliver high-speed internet throughout the country. Okay, so the technology at hand, or in light, as the case may be, which is already being used in the gas and oil industries, is called Distributed Acoustic Sensing, or DAS. So this is how it works. Light travels along the optical fibers. It encounters various impurities in the gas and bounces back. Now, if the fiber were completely stationary, the backscatter signal would always look the same. But if the fiber starts to stretch in some areas due to vibrations or strain, that backscatter signal changes. So this team at Stanford did some testing to see if distributed acoustic sensing could really work to monitor earthquake activity. So they laid down about three miles of optical fiber, which was installed under Stanford University in a figure eight shape. This optical fiber was also fitted with laser interrogators, which were specifically designed to record any movement in the fiber. And what did they find? About 800 seismic events in the first year of operation. So from September 2016 to September 2017, this fiber optic seismic observatory saw a wide range of activity, including small earthquakes, rumbles from a quarry nearby, and even that 8.2 magnitude earthquake that hit central Mexico, some 2,000 miles away. So it's certainly cool that these fiber optic cables were able to observe these seismic changes. But where does that early detection come from? Well, the difference lies in the different waves of an earthquake that ripple through the ground at different speeds. This team at Stanford was able to tell the difference between the two types of waves. P waves, which are much weaker waves that arrive first, and S waves, which are the stronger waves that arrive during the main event of the earthquake. Determining those P waves, that's the key. Now, the Stanford researchers contend that traditional seismometers are much more sensitive for monitoring earthquakes, but this new research is very promising. First and foremost, it's already in the ground, right? 
<laughs> if you want any further information about this earth-shaking new research study, I've included a link below the player on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com. All right, that's enough optics for today. But what about those passive infrared sensors I spoke of earlier? Now, if you're working on an IoT project, passive infrared sensors offer a lot of pluses. High reliability, low cost, low power consumption. But where do you start investigating the power of passive infrared sensors? Right here, my friends. In a recent episode of Chalk Talk entitled Passive Infrared Sensors, I sit down with Jeffrey Katz from Panasonic and chat about the latest in passive infrared sensors for your next design. You can check out this episode of Chalk Talk by heading on over to the Chalk Talk section of eejournal.com on the top banner right on the front page can't miss it. Or by clicking the link below the player on this week's fish fry in page. Or you can also head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can check out our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And hey, if LinkedIn is your thing, well, sure, you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have that YouTube channel I mentioned earlier, keyword EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of super cool techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. I'm just saying. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Fryin' page, you can grab our Fish Fryin' RSS feed or subscribe to Fish Fry via the iTunes Store. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Fryin' page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, any fun EE conference coming up that I absolutely should attend, or even the best geeky hotspot in your city, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 6th, 2018, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.